All right. So this next one is a little bit of an audible. Uh, Lisa Hansen was scheduled to give the presentation, but uh, due to a, um, a medical illness in her family, she wasn't able to attend. So we have a tag team approach that's going to do this in 20 minutes. We'll see. Um, so I'll let um, Kirsten start for Lisa Hansen. Let me do the full view here. Thank you, John Paul. Uh, I spoke to Lisa last night, and although there was a family emergency, everybody's okay. Um, I'm going to do my best to follow her presentation, but come join me. We'll read it, we'll read it along together. <laughs> uh, usual disclaimer. Oh, and can you keep me at 10 minutes? Ten. Dr. Srihari will be co-presenting yes. after me on this. Thank you. All right, according to Dr. Calieri, there are three regions at least, that play roles in handwriting. Uh, primary motor area, which controls fine movement. Premotor area, uh, controls visual guidance. And then the supplementary area that regulates muscle firing and the sequences of the firing. There are several stages involved with writing development. There's the pre-conventional, where the, usually the children who are learning to write um, <coughs> pretend that they're writing, and they draw pictures and uh, unusual images, unusual formations. There's the emergent, where they're beginning to write the letter formations. Then there's the developing, where they're writing more phonetically, doing the sound, uh, sound words like my cat runs. Uh, then they're beginning with the cop copybook phase to imitate the, uh, the pictures they see before them. Uh, content or spelling isn't important. Uh, finally, students begin to forget about how they're writing and can instead focus on what they're writing about. The brain is developing during the pre-adolescent years. Uh, young writers begin to think more about what the content and not how they're writing it. Uh, and one of the general statements made by FDEs is that as students stray from the copybook style they are taught, individual handwriting habits begin to develop. This is a hypothesis. This is what we uh, hope is happening. But there is no published, published literature to support this uh, yet. So uh, Lisa Hansen's study, which again has been funded by NIJ, thank you, Jerry, uh, is going to be a longitudinal study of second, third, and fourth grade students starting this year. And Lisa intends to collect their writing every year. She hopes until they graduate in 2024. Uh, but she'll be collecting <coughs> mounds of handwriting, and she has begun to do that. Uh, she'd like to look at how individual characteristics develop in grade school. Uh, NAS apparently has uh, requested something along these lines. Uh, and again, the hypothesis is, and this is what we hope is handwriting experts, that as the student stops imitating the copybook and starts just thinking about the content, they're developing their own individual characteristics. This is an example of the cursive and the hand printing that Lisa has obtained. Uh, on the left is a fourth grader, on the right is a second grader. Uh, for the second and third graders, Lisa's using the, the lines that have the dotted line in the middle, and then I think around third or fourth grade, they're just uh, solid lines. She's looking at over 2,200 students from two suburban Minnesota school districts, uh, hoping that the population will remain stable. She has started with second, third, and fourth grade students. And she hopes to collect samples every spring for three years, and then eventually to carry this forward by many more years. She asks the students to produce two cursive and two printed paragraphs. Interestingly, historically, the samples that she's collecting are from the last second graders who will be taught cursive writing in this district. So again, she's collecting from over 2,200. Uh, every sample will be digitized and will be uh, assessed in iFox software. And we hope to look, I'm, I'm sort of helping, uh, we hope to look at some additional data mining uh, with everything that we have collected. That's a lovely picture of the uh, Bureau of Criminal Apprehension in Minnesota, where Lisa works. So uh, she is focusing 
And this is, uh, you're going to see some of this repeated in my presentation after the break. Um, some of the same slides, in fact. Um, she is focusing on the word and, and then the TH combination. I am doing the same thing using IFOX. And I am also using the same truthing tool, which is developed by Dr. Srihari as part of IFOX. And uh, it simplifies everything greatly. It extracts the words that we want to focus on uh, automatically and then provides drop-down boxes of the characteristics that we have predetermined that we want to look at. Uh, for example, if we're looking at the formation of the staff of the A, we get a selection of whether it's tented, retraced, looped, there's no staff, or there's no fixed pattern. Each selection uh, has a number associated with it. So if, it, if we select tented, it'll be the number one or zero. I don't remember. Zero, one, two, three. And eventually, what we'll have for this sample is a string of numbers. Not quite sure what this is about. <laughs> so we'll move on. Um, so I have this similar slide in my presentation. This is an example of the iFox truthing tool. This is one writer's sample of Anne's. I, I must point out this is a grown-up's writing right here. This isn't any of the kids. Um, and the final string of numbers will, for example, indicate um, the um, characteristics that were selected by the document examiner. So number one represents that the initial stroke of the A starts to the left of the staff. Number two, the staff is looped and so on. When the document examiner is done inputting the data, uh, we have text files, one for cursive, one for handprint. And they look like this. So the first number is the writer identif identifier. The, the, first, the letter after that indicates which page of writing. We have three pages of writing for each writer, followed by the uh, characteristics that were observed. Dr. Srihari will speak in a minute about um, crunching the numbers for these strings that the document examiners have developed. And he will also explain this part. <laughs> Finally, um, thanks to iFox, uh, this is much less laborious than it has been in the past, observing and collecting the information. Uh, algorithms are being used to create statistical models, and we will use those models, we hope, one day to infer the probability of those characteristics. Lisa wants to, as I said, continue this uh, project until the kids have graduated. Uh, and once we have all this data collected, we can continue to mine it for other information. References? And any questions I probably can't answer? Go ahead. Yes, Peter. Oh, Peter needs a microphone. Hi, Lisa. Remember, Peter, we're on a time schedule here. Um, since this is a long-term project, are you going to go through the step that Tom Vastrick had outlined of uh, making sure that multiple people classifying this will classify it the same way? Because I, I know that when the Toronto people had a check class system, they were trained very rigorously by Ulf von Bremen to be consistent. And I know of big databases that have crashed when the person left and nobody could get anything to work anymore. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Srihari can address that. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Maybe Lisa can at some point. I was wondering if, uh, are they tracking uh, the students just by grade or also by age? Because there's, there's a, you know, especially in two, three, and four. She's going to follow the same group of students that she's starting with every year. So yes. she's starting at second, third, fourth. Next year will be third. You think third, there fourth, might be a, link, a linkage on ability uh, or when they go off the uh, worksheet? It might be dependent on also their age within that grade. We'd like to see if there is an age where they start to um, diverge from copybook and really develop unique characteristics. So, okay, I, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Srihari. Thanks again, Kirsten, for, uh, for batting <laughs> the opinion. <laughs> Yes. It's nice to have a room full of people that uh, can pinch hit for each other, uh, which is 
Really good. All right, Dr. Shari. Okay, my task here was uh, to take the data that uh, uh, Lisa and Kirsten are collecting and to see uh, what to make of this data. And uh, so this is uh, that part of the presentation. So let me begin with, uh, with the characteristics of the word and, and then I'll talk about the similarity to the standard Zena Blosser handwriting style. So these were uh, 12 characteristics of uh, the uh, word and when it is hand printed. On the left column are the, uh, 11 char uh, the 12 characteristics. <coughs> Uh, for example, the number of strokes in A is one uh, characteristic, and is it one, two, three, or, or is it an uppercase? And the formation of the A staff, the tented, retrace, loop, no staff, etc. So these uh, characteristics were actually defined by document examiners, and then they used the truthing tool we developed for them to look at those samples of AND and to say which characteristic it forms, so that is how the data is created. <coughs> Similarly, here are the 12, char uh, 12 characteristics of cursively written and. They're somewhat similar, but uh, some of them are different. So this is the set of characteristics, and uh, the truthing tool provides all these kinds of shapes and all that to give some guidance uh, to the document examiners. The truthing tool, uh, by the way, is, we call it as a, now as a universal truther, in the sense uh, you can um, put down, uh, pull down, uh, pull down menus for any word that you want, th or and, and things like that. So you can create data sets uh, using that tool, and we have left that job of creating the data sets to document examiners to say this is what we think of it, and then here we have it, and then we take it from there. So then we also created um, uh, the ground zero uh, or, or the zero base in terms of what is it supposed to be like, and uh, apparently the children are taught uh, this copybook style called Zener Blosser, and that's what the cursive and looks like, and that's what the hand-printed and looks like. We just took a font that's available called Zener Blosser. And uh, here are the characteristics uh, for the hand-printed uh, Zener Blosser copy book. So these are, there are, I don't know if you can tell from these slides, the Zener Blosser values are given in bold. Uh, and so, so those are the values, number of strokes in A is 1, formation of A staff, retraced, etc. So these are, the, these are the ground zero values, in the sense that's what it's supposed to be uh, in, in the copy book. Similarly, we have uh, for cursive in the Zener Blosser copy book, what are the values for these 12 variables? Those are again shown in bold. For instance, for initial stroke of A, the, uh, uh, the value for that particular uh, variable is a staff center. So on, okay, so that's the set of values. So we know how it's supposed to be and how the children write. So now we have uh, uh, the standard writing of Zena Blosser, and then we've got the children's writing of, of, uh, of that. And so we wanted some kind of a similarity measure. So we, have, we are dealing here with the 12 uh, what are called as categorical variables. So each of them take on some uh, set of values, uh, four values or six values or something like that. And they are not uh, on an ordinal scale. There's some categorical variables. So we got to think of how do we compare the actual writing with uh, the standard writing. So here is a very first cut measure. This is a project uh, that is just uh, you know underway. So we said let's start with something extremely simple, which we might modify. This is a simple uh, Euclidean distance measure. The distance or the similar or the dissimilarity between the standard S. Uh, and uh, or, or the student S and the uh, Zener Blosser Z is given by that measure, and those are the values, the characteristics. Uh, in this, uh, what this means is the uh, higher the distance D means less similarity. So we have some kind of a similarity or a dissimilarity measure or a distance measure. The initial data set to be received is an extremely small one. We're only 111 in grade two, 121 in grade three, and 71 in grade four writing printed. And then we have cursive, uh, zero for uh, grade two. Apparently, uh, uh, apparently they don't teach cursive in grade two. Uh, that's probably why we don't have any cursive for grade two. And I, I think uh, Kirsten just mentioned they're, they're discontinuing cursive completely. So uh, we will be dealing largely only with printed, it seems to me. But anyway, this is the data we got. Extremely small set. And see, what, what can you do with this before we get the 2,200 students and all that? So we just had an extremely small number. So we said there's a very first cut thing, not uh, 
uh, not really uh, indicative of what kind of results we're going to have. So we simply did here a histogram of uh, grade two uh, printed. What we're doing here is take all the grade two children's writing. How similar are they to the standard Zena Blosa? And then this is the kind of a distribution we got grade two printed with a, with this, the, 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 with a, with a certain mean and, um, and, a, and a standard deviation. Here is what it looks like for grade three. Interestingly, there are a couple whose, uh, a couple of values that seem to be extreme here. And here is grade four printed. So we have these kinds of histograms that we have. Uh, again, grade three cursive, uh, grade four cursive, grade, um, and so, so this particular chart summarizes it. On the left, we have uh, the printed means, and on the right, we have the cursive means. So what, it, what it's saying is that distance is 2, 3, 4, for example. It's saying almost between grade 2 and grade 3, the average distance of, uh, of the particular grade to the standard Zener Blosser is roughly about the same. But when we go from grade uh, 3 to grade 4, the distance seemed to have come down somewhat in the sense uh, uh, in the sense, uh, saying maybe the children are, are writing better when they are when they are going into a grade four. It's just a very early indicator. So, what does it mean for individuality? Maybe we want to be looking at saying as they increase, they become more individualistic, they become different. Perhaps that's that's what's going to happen. And this data again is you know extremely small and not fully indicative. When we have all the children's uh, data, these uh, histograms may look quite different. So we're we're doing this as a, a is a, pr in a preliminary study at this point, and uh, is that the best way to measure is one of the questions. Euclidean distance seems like a too simplistic a way of measuring similarity. There are two for categorical variables. Uh, we're thinking of um, the kullback leibler divergence of the distribution, for example, is another way of doing it. And there are several other di nicer distance measures for categorical variables. We're going to try out those two. So this was just done during the last two weeks. We said, let's just try something for this presentation. Um, and so, anyway, conclusion here is that from grade two to grade four, the average distance to Zena Blosser seems to reduce. And um, anyway, so this is just extremely preliminary. So, any kind of feedback, criticism, saying you should be doing this or that, I, I would welcome it because we are we are in the middle of of doing this. Okay, so I'll stop here. We have questions? Question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So I should bring your mic. Yeah, just leave it with I would never get through the agenda. Uh, I'm wondering if you've looked at the pedagogical, the traditional pedagogical literature uh, going back a century or so where you've got the uh, grade-specific grading scales used by the teachers where they say at grade two, this is an A, a B, a C, a D, an F for a child at that level trying to get to this particular uh, model. And they do get better as they go along, the teachers hope. So at some point, they have, you know, I don't know how many thousands of teacher years of experience condensed into these things, which might be interesting to put those into the distance measure and try and use that. Uh, experience and that literature to create an ideal curve for an age-specific group or a grade-specific group and then see where the individual children fall on that, how much teaching and practice is going on in the 21st century as opposed to the 20th century, and then see where the children start to deviate from last century's expectations of form uh, alignment with the copybook. And it's, a lot of that is scanned online. A lot of that's in the QDAD database. Okay, that's very interesting uh, that uh, there, are, there have been these kinds of studies done. Uh, sounds like it was done quite some time ago. Okay, okay, right. So we really should be looking at how they went about it. For example, did they also use categorical variables to characterize the shapes of the word uh, did they look at and, for example, or it might be some other word? Uh, TH is the most common letter combination in the English language. So we're going to do TH. A, uh, a, AN and ND are the second most common, second and third most common letter combinations. So we're doing that. If they had done a similar one, we could use some of their ideas. And also uh, the choice of the uh, measure 
uh, if they had a particular way of measuring the similarity, we could we could use that. And the other thought that occurs to me is uh, handwriting is a, a variable thing in terms of the teaching and all that. Maybe it was more rigorous some time ago, and now there might be more, much more variability. That would also be useful if we can quantify that today this is what the similarity is, and it used to be this much in the past as well. They have specific examples. They have specific examples. Those words are there. Mm -hmm. and right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for your